has no need of coinciding with the actual future, the anticipation has no need of being realized, for the predicted or anticipated future is in fact not at all the future, but a possible world which is and will remain unreal. Our ordinary metaphysics takes the form of a branching of a future that is branching out. The past is fixed, the future is open, and there exist possible worlds that will never occur. Uh, Valdez, the Argentinian writer, poetically called this ordinary conception of temporality uh, uh, the garden of forking paths, that tiempo, el jardín de senderos que se before. <coughs> the least <coughs> metaphysics of Gilda Anders' parable is obviously of a different sort. Here time appears as a loop, and I call it projected time, in which past and future determine each other. The future is taken to be no less fixed than the past is fixed in our ordinary metaphysics. In the work on Epsis, when asked when this catastrophe had taken place, he answered, tomorrow. The future is fixed. And the future is no less necessary than the past. The day after tomorrow, the flood will be something that will have been. The future is in, of the order of fate or destiny. In that temporality, where the future is fixed, the past is open, the past and the future must come together in a closed loop, and the future is the fixed point of the loop. That is, the future must be such that, being anticipated, the actions that this anticipation triggers in the present do not render causally possible the coming uh, of the future that, is, that was for him. Um, in that temporality, prudence cannot take the form of prevention. We must come up with something else. Why? Prevention presupposes that the undesirable event that you want to prevent is a possibility that will go unrealized. The unde undesirable event must be possible in order for us to have reason to act. But if our action is effective, it is not action. But here, in this temporality, an event that is possible but not realized, that doesn't exist. To foretell the future in projected time, this temporality, it's necessary to see the loop's fixed point, where an expectation on the part of the past with regard to the future, and a causal production of the future by the past, coincide. The predictor, knowing that his prediction is going to produce causal effects in the world, must take account of this fact if he wants the future to confirm what he foretold. And that's precisely what Jonah cannot achieve. You would have similar structures in Amos and other famous biblical predictors. Um, traditionally, which is to say in a world dominated by religion, this is the role of the prophet, and especially that of the biblical. He is, in general, an extraordinary individual, often eccentric, who does not go unnoticed. His prophecies have an effect on the world and the course of events, and an effect on the course of events for purely human and social reasons, but also because those who listen to them believe that the word of the prophet is the word of God, and that this word, which cannot be heard directly, has the power of making the very thing it announces come to pass. We would say today, in our current philosophical jargon, that prophet's word has a performative power. By saying things, it brings them into existence. Now, the prophet knows that. One might be tempted to conclude that the prophet has the power of a revolutionary. He speaks so that things will change in the direction he intends to give them. This would be to forget the fatalist aspect of prophecy. Prophecy describes the events to come as they are written on the great scroll of history, immutable, inevitable, inevitable. Revolutionary prophecy, of course, has preserved, think of Marxist prophecy, this highly paradoxical mix of fatalism and voluntarism that characterizes biblical prophecy. 
However, let me say a few words here. So we have two temporalities in which the notion of conflict takes a form of preventive war. That's what I call occurring time. There is no closure condition. And the notion of preemptive strike, which makes sense only in projected time, and we, when you have a closure condition. Now you are in a position to understand this. This is true. I mean, this is, I'm not making it up. Why is President? That was in March 2003. And Arthur Schlesinger Jr., who passed away uh, uh, asked, why is President Bush so keen on impersonating Tom Cruise, that is, the chief of police of Minority Report? And he's predicting a future, catastrophic future, that he stops Bush. You understand part of that? However, I'm speaking of prophecy here in a purely secular and technical sense. The prophet is the one who more prosaically, prosaically seeks out the fixed point of the problem, that is the point where voluntarism achieves the very thing that that fat fatality dictates. Let me say it again. The point where voluntarism achieves the very thing that fatality dictates. The prophecy includes itself in its own discourse. It sees itself realizing what it announces as destiny. In this sense, prophets are legion in our modern democratic societies, founded on science and technology. And the experience of what I call projected time is facilitated, encouraged, organized, not to say imposed by numerous features of our institutions. All around us, more or less authoritative voices are heard that proclaim what the more or less near future will be the next day's traffic on the freeway, the result of the upcoming elections, the rates of inflation and growth for the coming year, the changing levels of greenhouse gases, etc., etc. The futurists, whose appellation lacks grandeur, of course, of the prophets, know full well, as we do, that this future they announce to us, as if it were written in the stars, is a future of our own. Make. And we do not rebel against what we pass for a metaphysical scandal, except on occasion in the voting booth when we are told before we vote what the result of the election will be. It is the coherence of this mode of coordination with regard to the future that I have endeavored in my own, own work, the remit. I mean, the best ex uh, illustration of, so we have three ways of telling the future in human affairs. Prediction, as, in a, as if human affairs were like a physical system. Prospective, that's a French word which means a conception of the future as branching out. So you have the scenarios, precisely, and the kind of prediction of the future that I'm trying to rehabilitate. The prophet, knowing that his prophecy is going to produce causal effects in the world, must take account of this fact if he wants the future to confirm what he thought. Determination of future in projected time. Okay, we've seen that. And the formula, sorry? I may stop now? Um, okay, wrap, let me know. Okay. Uh, the French planning system, when it existed, when it's, it's been, for, been dead for many, many years, uh, aimed to obtain through consultations and research an image of the future sufficiently optimistic to be desirable and sufficiently credible to trigger the actions that would bring about its own realization. I mean, if you think of it, this makes sense only in the temporality that I call projected time. And we have to project ourselves in a desirable future, which is credible enough to give us the energy to render it positively uh, real. Now, what is the doomsday paradox? I messed up. Yeah, let me just write that in a minute. Okay, yes. Oh, should I stop now? <laughs> no, uh, we have to be. Can you reference in a minute? Well, no. The <laughs> answer. <laughs> so, so, the Doomsday Paradox, or the Jonah Paradox, the problem is to achieve coordination on the basis of a negative project that takes the form of a fixed future which one does not want. That's the source of the problem. Now, it's no longer the case of predicting a future that we want, a desirable future, but exactly the opposite. We must predict an undesirable